So it's um, nearly, well, it is uh, my fifth General Assembly has just begun. So I'm coming straight from the General Assembly, uh, which started last week with the rule of law debate. So it's, as I say, um, over four years now since I've been the legal counsel. And um, before I was appointed to this post, I was the legal advisor to the Irish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In many ways, I was an outsider coming from a small but committed member state, looking in at how this vast and complex body worked. And in some ways, this allowed for only a fleeting glance at the issues of real importance in the world, and at other times, at a more, with a more concentrated focus on issues of national concern. So I did wonder when I started at the extent to which public international law would really feature in the work of the organization. So I was somewhat skeptical and at the same time hopeful. But I can say now in my fifth year that international law really lies at the heart of everything we're doing um, in, the, in the UN, in the organization. And I find myself at the table on most of the issues, the political issues that we're facing in the world. So before, before I give you a sense of that centrality of international law, I think it's very important to mention, of course, the Charter, which is the very basis and foundation of the organization. The UN was established not only to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, but as the preamble also significantly provides to establish conditions under which justice and respect for obligations arising under treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. Over the years, the UN has seen periods when international law has seemed more marginal. That possibly explains my curiosity when I joined. But I now see that in our, as our function as the guardian of the global legal architecture, that international law does really feature centrally in the work of the organization. We live in an era when international law is no longer the business of international courts. It's being addressed in sustained and systematic ways in many national courts and in regional courts. So it really, in the very recent past, has developed, I think, a greater significance um, in, in terms of international relations. So I thought I'd just give you a sense of my office and the kind of work that we do just very briefly before I go into some substantive issues. My office has about 200 at the moment. Um, it's a very small office in the context of the organization more broadly. Um, we deal with a wide range of international law issues, but also in issues that one wouldn't imagine necessarily that the UN has to grapple with. So I have six divisions, just to give you a sense. So the Office of Legal Counsel, my immediate office, we deal with issues on peacekeeping. We have, of course, 17 peacekeeping operations around the world. Um, we have over 100,000 peacekeepers with all the issues that arise there and the mandates under which these peacekeeping operations operate is subject to the legal advice of, of my office. That part of the office deals with um, privileges and immunities, um, general advice on public international law and the laws of war. Um, that just gives you a general sense of that. Then we have a division which deals with oceans affairs and the law of the sea. We have a division that deals with treaty law. The Secretary General is the depository for 550 multilateral treaties. So we deal with all the legal issues that arise there. But the depository function lies in my office. I have a division known as the General Legal Division, which deals with contracts of over $4 billion at the moment, um, and peacekeeping issues also, procurement issues in relation to the organization more broadly. We have a new system of administration of justice, which was established in 2009, just soon after I started, for the now over 75,000 staff we have around the world. So we have our own centralized system of administration of justice, which has two tiers, um, a lower court and an appeals court, and this is also run through my office. I have an office in Vienna, which is the International Trade Law Division of the Office of Legal Affairs, which um, deals with, it's a secretariat for UNCITRAL. Um, which focuses very much on, on, on international trade law. So being a lawyer in a political environment, and I know that I, there are some in, in, in this room that will sympathize with this even from a domestic perspective, brings with it a very distinct role where the provision of objective legal advice is essential for policy decision making. 
It's critical for decision makers to take into account legal, um, the legal implications of their decisions before they take the decision. So that's essentially our main objective, is to try to ensure that legal advice is brought to the table before decisions are made. But of course, in many, many cases, we are also reactive. Just to touch on a, the sort of breadth of, of, of situations which legal issues have been very much at the heart of that we've had to deal with, and I'm only throwing these out so that in the question and answer time you can ask me questions if you like, because I won't go into much detail on them. But when I started, we had, of course, the terrible events that occurred in Gaza. We've dealt with the flotilla incident, um, as I'm sure everybody here is, is aware of. Very, a lot of issues in relation to the Middle East. We've um, had to focus very much on Palestine and the question of Palestine's application to the United Nations, but also more, more intensely in a way, because that was a sort of specific issue at a particular time, is the question of the status of Palestine um, within the organization. And in light of the fact that it joined UNESCO last year, it has given rise to a, a lot of um, legal implications. This year, Palestine is quieter at the moment, as opposed to exactly this time last year, when the application of Palestine to um, become a member of the organization was before the Security Council, which had come through the Secretary General. So, and then we've had to deal with situations like Cote d'Ivoire, Libya, of course, Haiti, Sri Lanka, constantly the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a constant issue on our, on our table, and, uh, and Syria, which, which I will speak about more specifically. So that's just to give you a sense of the range. So what's the vision of my office? I thought maybe I'd just touch on that very briefly with respect to the implementation of international law for the UN as a global actor. As the Legal Council, my task is to support the Secretary General's commitment to the strengthening of the rule of law, the pursuit of justice, and specifically the ending of impunity for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. So this is very much at the, at the heart of the sort of advice and sort of um, relationship that we have with the Secretary General in terms of supporting his commitment to the rule of law. Um, why is the rule of law important? Essentially, the rule of law is vital, just in a crisp sense, for the establishment of uh, respect is, is fundamental and, and essential for the prevention of conflict, for the establishment of peace in the aftermath of conflict, for the effective protection of human rights, and of course, for sustainable economic progress and development. So in this connection, I was delighted to um, uh, have a role to play in, with the Secretary General at the rule of law debate which commenced last Monday. It was the first time that the General Assembly has decided to take on the rule of law as a specific topic to discuss and debate before the main General Assembly began on Tuesday. So it was a very, very interesting day, and it was remarkable, I think, that over 50 heads of state and government decided to come to New York for the earlier day in order to engage and to be involved in the rule of law discussions. Um, so I thought that was quite indicative in terms of the importance that is now attached to rule of law, that the fact that over 50 came, and then the rest were essentially foreign ministers. Um, so it was an extremely high level of attendance at the debate. So I thought maybe I'd touch on two somewhat topical issues. I was going to speak about the Congo, but I think in terms of timing, I'll wait until, until questions if anybody is interested. And I thought I'd focus on the UN's work for the ending of impunity for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, and then to also talk about responsibility to protect, which is, of course, linked to this topic. Um, international justice generally, the 1990s and early 2000s were historical periods in international justice for the obvious reasons that we had had the terrible atrocities committed in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. And the international community was galvanized at that time uh, as a result of the, the terrible events that had occurred and the difficulties which the world and the United Nations faced in dealing with those situations and the terrible failures that occurred at that time. So the, as I say, the, the international community was very focused as a result of which it was decided to establish by the Security Council the special tribunals for uh, Yugos, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. And I think these tribunals were evidence of the recognition that um, the, the, the principles established at Nuremberg, which really had been allowed to lie fallow for all the years after Nuremberg, that individuals will be held accountable for the per perpetration of atrocity crimes. So this is now very much at the, at the, at the heart of 
the United Nations quest for justice. So my office has been very closely um, engaged in the establishment of these courts and in supporting them throughout, throughout their work. I believe, there are many skeptics, but I believe that they have achieved an enormous amount in terms not only of bringing justice um, for the victims, um, but justice in terms of accountability for, of, of the individuals who are engaged. Um, but also it has, in a sense, international justice in these regions, both in Rwanda and the broader region in Africa, but also in the former Yugoslavia, have brought, um, have brought sort of the rule of law to the region. And in a sense, these courts have become the catalyst for the rule of law. Um, at a very, very difficult times, post-conflict transitions for these, for these uh, two, two, uh, two countries and, and regions. Heads of state, of course, have not been exempted, and an impressive body of jurisprudence has evolved and developed. So some 18 years now after their establishment, the ICTY and the ICTR are basically closing their doors and folding up. The um, recent arrests last year and the year before, Miladic, Har um, Hadic, and the trial of Karadic are all underway. And the appeals will be determined by the, both those courts and the residual mechanism which is being established by the Security Council to take on the necessary after effect work of, of the two tribunals, which includes, of course, the maintenance of archives, dealing with the potential the fugitives in the case of Rwanda, because there are no fugitives from the ICTY. Um, and protection of witnesses and other, other issues, which some of you will be familiar with. But all of this is now being dealt with, with a new, by a new residual mechanism, which will be established. The, um, the uh, special, oh, I just should mention in relation to the ICTY, that it, I think it's quite an extraordinary statistic that all 161 indictees have been brought to justice um, in one way or another, some have died, but all of them have been brought before the court. In other words, there are no fugitives um, that have, were identified um, by the prosecutor that have, who have managed to escape justice. So that in itself is, is quite an extraordinary statistic. The ICTR, we can't say quite the same thing, but it also has been extremely uh, successful. Um, and now some of the remaining trials are being transferred um, to Kigali um, on foot of the conviction of the court that Kigali is now in a position um, to administer justice in a way that achieves international standards necessary uh, for, for the UN to be able to pass on, pass on the work to them. So then we have the special court for Sierra Leone, which of course also has folded its doors. Um, after, in, 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 terms of, in terms of the work that's being done in, in Sierra Leone, the Charles Taylor trial uh, was produced, the former president of, of, of uh, Liberia produced a successful conviction. And what's astonishing and, and remarkable about this case is that, of course, it was the conviction of a former head of state uh, by an international criminal tribunal for planning, aiding, and abetting um, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And of course, this case, and I sense this very much in the UN in New York, it has really truly sent a signal to leaders that um, sovereignty is no longer a barricade for justice and that the, a day of accountability and a day of reckoning will come for those who perpetrate these crimes and that head of state immunity, while of course it still exists um, and is very much something to which we are committed, um, nevertheless it doesn't apply in a wide range of circumstances and a former head of state will be, will be vulnerable. Then finally, in terms of the ad hoc tribunals, I'd like to mention the extraordinary chambers for the courts of Cambodia, which uh, some of you will have heard me speak about before, and I know that some of you are particularly interested, which I find really, really um, quite unusual, quite frankly, that um, when we speak about international justice, people are not really interested in what, what has gone on in Cambodia. I think it's, it's far away, and it's, it's, it sort of seems like an awfully long time ago, but uh, quite honestly, I think that the, the court in Cambodia is in the course of, try, of trying possibly or arguably the most significant um, war crimes trial since, since Nuremberg, despite all the terrible things that have happened in the world and the other courts and what they have had to do. Um, as you know, the Khmer Rouge uh, uh, in, uh, between 1975 and 1979 essentially obliterated a quarter of their population. So this is, this is a system of justice which has been established to determine accountability for those crimes. It, was, it is an extremely difficult court to manage. It crosses my plate virtually every day in one way or another. There are allegations of um, political interference. There has been political interference. There have been um, difficulties with regard to um, 
to corruption in the court, all sorts of unimaginable and unimaginable difficulties to be, to be handled. However, the court is still, is still going. We have the conviction of Kian Gukev, um, who otherwise known as Doik, who was the head of the S21 prison, which was a prison um, which had been a school just outside of Phnom Penh, where up to 20,000 people, he supervised this, this prison, and uh, uh, up to 20,000 people came through the prison and were either killed there and tortured and killed, or sent to the killing fields of Chongek, just outside of Phnom Penh. And um, he was convicted for of 35 years um, and reduced to 19 years for the years he had served. And I thought, and having come from this environment with my legal training and my, the wonderful people that I worked with who had trained me well, um, I was very well equipped to, um, to discuss and argue on the question of the sentencing because... In Cambodia, the people were devastated at the fact that he had only got 35 years and they could not understand why he hadn't had his head chopped off or his, at least had, had, um, had a life sentence. And what I said in the United Nations, which was a lot of words I know and certainly words for the people of Cambodia, um, was that, that this is symptomatic of a rule of law discussion in any democratic state where sentencing in this country, and I would speak about my own country, that when sentences were delivered um, by judges, very often there would be that national debate about is it enough or should it have been more or was it enough or the rape or whatever it is, and that this is a healthy a sign within Cambodia of the fact that the court in itself has become a catalyst for the rule of law, and these sort of discussions are not bad, although that doesn't, needless to say, assist the victims. Um, one of the things that also struck me that may be of interest was that, you know, 35,000 people came from the villages and towns in Cambodia just to come to the courtroom, just to be there. Many of them, of course, couldn't get in, but just to be somewhere in the vicinity of this very decrepit, I have to say, courtroom, because we go through terrible times in relation to the buildings and the monsoons and the, all the rest of it. But they came and they stood there just to feel the justice. And if I may, which is not a legal point, just describe my... Um, my, my experience is I've had to go to Phnom Penh on a number of occasions because of the difficulties which we're facing. But the first time I went, I was um, asked if I'd like to go to Chong Ek, the, having gone to the S21, which I felt I had to do, um, uh, having been persuaded, that I, would I like to go to the Chong Ek fil killing fields? And having lived in Cambodia as a child, I thought, I, you know, I really need to be able to, to do this. So... I went to the, the killing fields, and because of the monsoon rains, this is to show you the sort of the fact that this country is still very, very, very underdeveloped, and, and although it's, 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 it's doing so much better now, but when I walked in, there was nobody there in this, the, the killing fields. There were no other, there were no tourists, there was nobody there. And I was taken across the fields to different places, to trees, and to, to, to and one or two of you I know have, have also been there. But um, the rains had just come, and out of the ground were little rags of blue. And I said to my guide, so what, what, are, what, are, what are these? And they said, that's just the clothes of the people who are. So the ground, in other words, that the rains are such that the, the, the bones are still coming up from the ground, and the Cambodians haven't, haven't yet. Maybe they leave them there in order to... to but it was a very, very desolate uh, experience um, for me and for everybody just to, just to even see it. So that they're essentially the, into the ad hoc tribunals um, uh, that, that, as I say, are coming to a close. So now we have the, what's left is the International Criminal Court, which is, of course, the most significant permanent, the only permanent court we have to administer international criminal justice. And the International Criminal Court will now take over and has already started to do significant work. We're celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. And I... When I talk about the ICC, I take every opportunity to, to refer to the role of states and the principle of complementarity upon which international justice is essentially founded. And the principle of complementarity is that essentially it is the, state, it is the duty of states, first and foremost, to prosecute for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. And that international criminal justice is not there to, to supersede or take over the role of national jurisdictions, but to complement them. So it's only where states are either unable or unwilling, or a combination of both, to prosecute for these crimes does international justice come into play. Um, the, the principle of complementarity is crucial for the future of international criminal justice and the quest to end impunity for these grave violations. Um, it's clear that the role of national jurisdictions and the principle of complementarity has become 
the absolute bedrock of international justice. What, what I tend to say in many arguments that seem to come our way in relation to the selectivity of justice within the ICC, et cetera, that, that um, essentially justice, and, and I know in this room you're very aware, but we have to say it in an international context because of the fears of intrusion on sovereignty and, and all of that um, um, anxieties that, the, 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 that many in the international community have about international justice, that justice is a nation's choice and essentially, it is, the, it is for nation states in the first instance to determine where, uh, where and how accountability should be brought to bear. But the reality is that in many, many states in the world, they are not capable or they are not willing to prosecute. And we have examples um, across the board that, that we can discuss in, in greater detail. Um, so I think with, with the ICC, the last thing to mention is that um, it is now, currently it has jurisdiction over seven situations. Um, they are based in Africa, and this is where the selectivity, selectivity um, criticism comes into play because it's all in Africa. But what we must bear in mind is that many of these situations are self-referrals, and arguably the ICC would not even exist if it weren't for Africa. So the following situations, the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Uganda, Darfur, Libya, Kenya, and Cote d'Ivoire. In the case of Darfur and in the case of Libya, the Security Council decided to refer both these situations um, to, the, to the ICC, so it isn't a case of self-referral. The others, on the other hand, are cases of self-referral. Um, the court did convict, have one conviction, and that is this year in the case of Lubanga, um, who's been convicted of war crimes of conspiring, uh, conscripting children under the age of 15 into armed groups, enlisting children into armed groups, and using children uh, to participate actively in armed conflict. So essentially, there are, there are I think, four key elements to international criminal justice that I think we can take away at this time, 10 years into the ICC and with the folding up of the ad hoc tribunals. First is that the old era of impunity is well and truly over. In its place, slowly but surely, we have established and are establishing an age of accountability. Secondly, in this new age of accountability, nobody is above the law. We would take this for granted here, but internationally that is something that could never be taken for granted, and it certainly can't, and it can't still, but it's something that we, we are uh, um, um, very committed to, and the international community has shown its commitment to this. And in particular, heads of state. Leaders will eventually be held accountable for their actions. Thirdly, as I've mentioned before, sovereignty is no longer a barricade, and the days of sovereignty being a barricade to justice are gone. And finally, the most difficult of all, there is no peace without justice. Peace and justice must go hand in hand. Very obvious, nearly cliched statements to make at this point, but something that we grapple with every day of the week in the United Nations in relation to the peace uh, um, deals and peace um, negotiations which we are trying to trying to discuss. I had a meeting um, last week, just to give you an example, and we'll talk more about, about Syria, but I had a meeting with Lakhtar Brahimi um, just before I left, who has been appointed by the League of Arab States and the Secretary General as his special representative, and um, he has to deal with the question of balancing the peace with justice, and of course at the moment, as you can imagine, the only thing on his mind is peace. But it is something that we make a point of saying that you cannot move forward on peace without justice being taken into account. How we do that, of course, is, is, is a whole other day's work. Um, so I thought now to just turn to the concept of responsibility to protect. Um, many of you may know about this, this principle, uh, but so those of you who are familiar with it, forgive me for starting at scratch, I'll just very briefly. This is a relatively new concept, but it's been highly relevant in a number of conflicts in the last few years, but particularly in the last two years, Cote d'Ivoire, Libya, and Syria. Um, it's still evolving and is developing. In essence, in 2005, the international community and heads of state and government um, agreed that there should no longer be a tolerance of the perpetration of war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and ethnic cleansing. So the the community agreed that um, they would put together this, this principle which would lie at the heart of hopefully everything that would be done in this extremely broad area um, and objective of the UN. So essentially, the, to, to give a brief explanation, we divide it into three pillars. The first pillar is the obvious one, but it's so obvious and yet 
and yet there is so much work to be done. The first pillar is the responsibility of states to protect their own populations from war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide and ethnic cleansing. The second pillar is the responsibility of the international community to assist states where they are failing uh, or where they indeed, where they need, they don't even have to have failed, where they need assistance in relation to uh, protection of the civilians from these um, uh, atrocity crimes. And the third, which is by far the most controversial and difficult, is where states are manifestly failing to protect their populations, the responsibility of the international community to take timely and decisive action to intervene to protect populations. Now, before we go into the, the use of force and Chapter 7 issues, I should focus a little bit on the other elements, which are Chapter 6 and Chapter 8 of the Charter. Chapter 6 is, the char is that part of the Charter which deals with the peaceful resolution of disputes and peaceful, um, peaceful settlement of disputes. The aim of Chapter 6 is to try to bring about peaceful uh, resolution before conflicts occur. And even when conflicts occur, during the course of those conflicts, to use the tools under Chapter 6, which do not amount to the use of force, um, to, to try to, uh, to, to uh, uh, reduce the, the, um, the difficult elements of, of a conflict or potential conflict. And the um, Chapter 8 is the engagement of regional organizations, which we can see very much is going on at the moment in relation to Syria. In fact, the fears of Syria are not just Syria, but largely the region as well and the impact that this is going to have on the region. So the regional organizations are very, very engaged there. But the most difficult part of the third pillar is the question of the use of force and the obligation of the international community to take timely and decisive action. Um, and this is Chapter 7. And under Chapter 7 of the Charter um, is the authorization to use force um, uh, when the Security Council agrees that force should be used. It's taken under Chapter 7. And what I, what I find the most controversial aspect is when the whole concept really was beginning to be debated at the very beginning of my term as the legal counsel, what I found was most of the NAM, most of the, the developing world have a real anxiety about, and, and beyond the developing world, a real anxiety about responsibility to protect being used as a tool to go over and above the provisions of the charter. In other words, that, that it provides a legal basis um, for humanitarian intervention. And of course, we have the whole situation in, in, that we had in Kosovo and the intervention um, uh, by NATO without, uh, without Security Council authorization. So the question there was, well, is, is that legal? But that's, that's, an, that's also a, a, a difficult topic and, and a separate topic. So what I say is, and have said consistently and uh, very often not to very welcoming ears, is that the, the Charter does not allow the use of force over and above two areas. One, where the Security Council has given its authorization, which of course requires the uh, authorization of the concurring votes of the permanent five members, or in self-defense under Article 51. And clearly when we're talking about responsibility to protect, we're not talking about self-defense. So essentially, there cannot be intervention legally under the Charter uh, without, without the authorization of the Security Council. So responsibility to protect signifies a broad acceptance of fundamental principles of human rights. It reinforces the normative content of crimes of gen genocide, uh, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And it affirms states' obligations under international law to prevent, prosecute, and punish these atrocity crimes. At the heart of R2P is the recognition that state sovereignty, which is of course the cornerstone of international relations, entails responsibility. And this underscores that sovereignty entails enduring obligations towards one's people as well as certain privileges. And this in itself is, is not a new concept that sovereignty is responsibility or entails responsibility, but in terms of the debates that are going on to this day, um, it is very often a debate between those who maintain that sovereignty requires absolute non-intervention in the affairs of states. But then if the riposte is that sovereignty entails responsibility, then it is primarily the responsibility of states in the first instance and then the international community to ensure that, uh, that um, as populations are protected from these crimes. So having said that it doesn't add a new layer of international law, the real question then is, well, what does it, what does it do? What is the added value? And it's quite subtle and quite difficult, but, but, but there is an added value, of course. 
Um, and what, to just put it as succinctly as I can, I think to say that it encapsulates the moral and legal imperative of the international community in relation to these four crimes. It's a potentially powerful vehicle for an important political process where political pressure as well as tangible technical and material assistance may be brought to assist states to exercise their responsibilities. Some argue that R2P has no normative effect and others hold that it's an enabling new norm. But as I've said, it doesn't create any um, new layer of international law. But what I say is that while it's not an obligatory new norm, it doesn't impose any binding new duties. It does confer additional responsibility. And that responsibility is the responsibility to take action. And what's interesting about this is that, is that while it doesn't add a new layer of, of international law, it is resonating more and more in international relations. If you look at the resolutions that were taken, which I'll speak a little bit more in more detail about Libya, but the resolutions that were taken in relation to Libya, the very, very beginning of Res Security Council Resolution 1970 expressly refers to responsibility to protect. And bear in mind that China and, and Russia were part of this. So to have, the, have them as well as, as the obvious states within the P5 actually using the concept of responsibility to protect as a basis for them going on to, in the case of Libya, referring the matter to the International Criminal Court and taking sanctions and taking other measures under Chapter 7. And then, of course, under 1973, Security Council Resolution 1973, the authorization for the taking of all necessary measures for the protection of the civilian population. All of this was done under the rubric and architecture of responsibility to protect. Of course, we've had kickback then um, in relation to Libya uh, after, afterward, after the, the events, which I'll just touch on in a moment. How am I doing, Dohi, on time? I'm, okay. I'm all right, good. Um, just to, to, to give a sense of where does the rule of law sit in all of this, um, we, we had to look at this very carefully in, in my office because it, it, the, the concept didn't, didn't sit within my office. There's a special representative of the Secretary General and uh, he has a very clear and loud voice on the topic and basically was focused um, on this topic uh, that this was his job as well as a special representative on genocide. And they joined offices. But the, the constant concern that I had was, well, where, where are the lawyers in all of this? We need to be there at the coalface of R2P. And the first tool that I used, which really helped us to get into the very heart of, of the subject, um, is, is the fact that, the very obvious one, but the fact that the rule of law weaves its way through each of the pillars. If you think of the first pillar, which is the pillar of the, of the responsibility of states to protect their own population, the rule of law is so obviously there. States that, um, that enter into agreements, international agreements, for the protection of refugees, human rights uh, treaties, um, join the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court, and actually implement the provisions of these, um, of these international uh, um, uh, treaties, are less likely to uh, degenerate into situations of, of, uh, of the atrocity crimes that I've referred to. The first pillar requires that states manage, and this is something that I think is very particular, say, when you think about Rwanda, that states manage diversity to promote equality, inclusivity, respect for fundamental rights, and observance of democratic values and practices. In this way, states provide the architecture for the prevention of these crimes. So that's how, in the first pillar, in a simple way, um, rule of law is so critically important. The second pillar is much more obvious, which is the responsibility of the international community to assist states um, to develop, uh, to develop uh, their, their societies and structures in a way and their infrastructure in a way that prevents them from going down the path of, of the commission of these crimes. And there it is a responsibility, I think, of all of us, and we in Ireland, I think, do an enormous amount um, for, for the international uh, quest um, to bring justice and rule of law to states. Um, and the third pillar, then, is, of course, as I've mentioned, the more technical aspects, why the rule of law is so very much at the heart of what, what we talk about in relation to issues such as the use of force, that while there may be the well-intentioned desire to include humanitarian intervention until states decide to change the charter, um, this, this does not fall uh, foursquare within responsibility to protect. Um, 
I've mentioned about Libya and the fact that uh, all the different measures that were, were taken there really fell four square within responsibility to protect. I, I think at this stage it's premature, I mean, despite the fact that there was a lot of controversy, obviously, after the NATO action and a lot of a lot of strong views that, that the NATO action had gone too far. Um, you can see both sides of, of the argument, and as the legal counsel, I'm somewhat circumspect in coming down on either side. So what I would say is that it's premature to pass judgment still at this stage, but the NATO, the NATO intervention was applauded for stemming the violence against the civilian population, while it's also been criticized for going beyond the limits of the Security Council authorization. Some states expressed concern that, they that it went beyond what was strictly necessary. Others maintained that the protection of civilians in Libya required the drastic action that was taken and that many thousands of lives uh, were saved. Well, the facts speak for themselves. Um, in this connection, just with regard to the NATO action, I think a significant feature in terms of the criticisms is that the International Commission of Inquiry, which was appointed by the Human Rights Council, found that NATO had conducted a highly precise campaign with the demonstrable determination to avoid civilian casualties. So that view, I think, is the predominant view um, uh, uh, in relation to the situation in Libya. We have now um, a mission in Libya, UNS UNSMIL, um, another one of these UN acronyms, but my office works extremely closely with that mission. And there I say that people have asked me, well, what responsibility to protect is no longer relevant for Libya. And I say, but of course it still is, because if you go to the first pillar and you think about the responsibility of states to protect their own populations, now we have a state in transition, a state that is really trying to find its feet, and it's a very delicate stage. And particularly with what's going on in the region, that it's very important that the international community assists that state to prevent it from ever deteriorating into the sort of environment in which it was before. So this is where the first and second pillars come back into play and what the UN is currently doing there. Um, I've spoken about international criminal justice and I think it's very important to, to, for us to bear in mind that the concept of responsibility to protect um, can't succeed without a credible threat of a response and a common conviction that the world will no longer tolerate impunity for um, atrocity crimes. So this is a sort of a natural link between the two subjects. Um, just one final, final point on, on, on the concept. Um, after the Libya action and all the criticisms that came forward, a number of states got together and um, came to the General Assembly with a new concept. And we'd ha we haven't, of course, even vaguely got started with the concept of responsibility to protect. But with their concern, particularly about the third pillar and about the use of force, Brazil uh, took the initiative to bring to the table a measure um, which w was, to, from, from their perspective, to replace or supplant responsibility to protect, which is called responsibility while protecting. The notion being that the Security Council, and you can see why, where the concern links to the initiative that they took, that the Security Council, before it takes any decision to use force, um, would have to decide, uh, look at, consider, and decide upon issues such as, is this a matter of last resort? What is the proportionality issue? And to regard, have a, a proper regard to the issue of proportionality and to do a proper assessment of the balance of consequences. That this under the responsibility while protecting would become an obligation of the Security Council. And then secondly, when, an, when a decision is taken to actually use force, that the Security Council would be under an obligation to monitor and to report uh, to the, the broader community um, the carrying out of the taking of, uh, taking of action with use of force. So this, this, this concept, when it came up first of responsibility while protecting, really caused a lot of concern because of feeling of, well, that'll just push back R2P and there will be no progress um, if we put something else on the table. But I found, particularly last week, that there's more and more discussion about responsibility while protecting because there is so much concern about the Security Council. So we, we anticipate that there will be possibly some sort of healthy dynamic between the two and that they will evolve together and possibly at some point in, in the future blend. Um, so with this concept very much at the forefront of our efforts, um, we of course are thinking about it every day, every hour of every day in relation to what's going on, what's going on in, in Syria. Um, so I'm happy to take any, any questions in relation to this, this topic, but just very briefly to say that the challenge for the international community is to find ways to prevent further escalation of the conflict. But just on the R2P contribution, 
We say that it's to underscore the responsibilities of states vis-a-vis -vis their populations to pressure and motivate the international community to help states to meet them. This is a given and it seems to be happening every day when so much of the world is focused on, on uh, Syria. Um, as I've said earlier, under the third pillar, it does include the taking of collective action where states fail to meet their obligations. Uh, just to, 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 to say, and of course it's not just to do with R2P, it's to do with the changed world we live in. But um, I was very curious um, last year when the Syria, uh, the terrible situation in Syria started to, 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 to evolve, um, I was very curious as to the extent to which the organization had looked at the the, the terrible tragedy that had happened now nearly 30 years ago mm. when Assad's father slaughtered over 20,000 of his people in Hama. And I wanted to know whether either my office or the Security Council or the General Assembly or any organ of the organization had even had a look at what had happened then. And despite our trawling through everything, we found absolutely nothing. So there was 30 years ago, which really isn't that long ago, this issue, this terrible event occurred, and the Security Council did not bring it to the table. The General Assembly didn't have a discussion about it, and my office had never any engagement. Now, my day is taken up every day, at the beginning of every day, on Syria. Um, the business of the Security Council, while it seems to the world as though it's really not doing anything, and it's not doing possibly what it should be doing, the, the, uh, and there is undoubtedly a paralysis at a certain level with regard to certain issues. It nevertheless is the case that the Security Council is having to look at this issue every day and the General Assembly. Last week, I don't think there was a single speaker who stood up during the de debate who didn't speak about Syria. So th there's a definitely a changed world. And of course, when we are trying to promulgate the concept of responsibility to protect and all that it means, we say that you know, it is to do with of course, a changed environment and changed communications, etc., but also to do with the fact that the world is now alive to the responsibility not only of states for their own populations, but also of the international community um, to protect populations from these terrible crimes. So I think I'll, I'll stop with that, Dahi. Is that all right? And uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>